so let's try another approach um, last time I suggested the approach of cogency out of common sense um, by thinking through examples which um, may be compelling to common sense such as the, um, example which demonstrates the um, possible uh, flaws in our sense um, in our eyes and our um, ears and so on through the example of um, uh, the earth being at rest but um, also moving and our senses can't show us that it's the earth is moving around its axis or in other ways in relation to the galaxy and um, the universe um, this time um, that would link up basically to what I will call the Prussian century and I regard Nietzsche as a Prussian thinker um, rather than German um, without qualification um, and we can think of Heidegger as breaking from the Prussian century. The Prussian century is the century of Wissenschaft, which I think is the highest um, tradition of scientific thinking. Um, it's a supreme moment of scientific thinking, um, of the thinking being, of the human beings. Um, there's a... In the um, Heidegger's uh, seminar on Nietzsche, he says, um, but truth, according to Nietzsche, is fixation. Is not this project then also such a fixation, if not exactly scientific, question mark? So he's alluding to Nietzsche's project, which he understands... Um, in one, uh, there's various ways you can amass um, words of Heidegger to show what Heidegger, to demonstrate what Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche's, um, of the pith of uh, Nietzsche's whole work is. One is through the lens of the Cartesian switch where Descartes understands the ego or the I as coextensive with um, the cognito or the thinking content. So roughly like the um, way later on Hume said the ego is just a kind of title card um, for a bunch of content and it's really the content we're talking about. Um, so, ego cognito ergo sum, but you could say in Nietzsche, the Heidegger says here, Nietzsche, what Nietzsche is saying is, um, the ego stands for, um, however you say life in Latin, viva or whatnot, ego viva ergo sum. So, life is that content which is the I. Um, so in this sense um, Heidegger criticizes Nietzsche for still following a certain let's say style of scientific thinking um, so what's the alternative here we have an alternative in the tradition which is the so called um you can say we can say that this um, uh, how do you say speculum spec um, no not spec um, sorry this the Prussian tradition as it builds up is like um, the positive thinking Wissenschaft verges towards positivism 
and this is not just a tradition in um, the hard connected to the hard sciences or whatnot, but it's also a theological tradition. Um, and therefore, you can see that, I mean, one could um, understand Hegel even as a theologian, let's say. One can understand the great German idealist essentially as a kind of theologian, maybe a halfway house between speculative thinking, which is what we're going to turn towards. We're going to say now there's another option, which is the speculative option in contradistinction to the, let's call it the first option, the positing or positive option, po positivum. Um, this is a distinction made in theology, um, but we can superimpose it on um, the Western tradition. Um, and of course, it's also uh, made in various ways within philosophy, which uh, you could say science is the name for the part of philosophy which won out and then became uh, the hard sciences, sciences and then the um, qualified or bastardized form of the hard sciences called the social sciences, which have um, fallen on evil times and have a um, reputation of being no better than quote-unquote ideology. Um, in passing, I note that ideology is really a word which um, is coextensive with the fact-value distinction and um, arises out of it and can't be done away with unless the fact-value distinction is also uh, done away with. So um, speculative can be understood as instead of going through various um, cogency um, or um, collecting of that which would impel us towards a view. So, for instance, in reflecting that there's a different um, Aristotle and Plato every hundred years or so, if you study closely, and certainly the Georgian, um, uh, under the rule of King George, the uh, Plato and Aristotle were understood uh, considerably different in a different style than they were um, uh, than they are um, in the time of Russell, Bertrand Russell, for instance, let's say, with all these, um, and the uh, Oxbridge people who spent a lot of time studying um, Platonists, um, and in any other period, it's the same. And then you get this sense of um, we can't grasp things in the ordinary way. Also, likewise, um, with all Nietzsche's understanding of the um, impossibility of the kinds of things such that he eventually comes out with statements like um, life is just um, one kind live the living is just a one kind of the dead a very rare kind thinking of you know the famous saying of the um, the human beings on a remote uh, glittering star amongst um, countless other stars and everything else is basically a desert maybe there's a little bit of microorganisms here or there, maybe there's some aliens, who knows, but um, on the whole, life is pretty rare amongst uh, uh, space. Um, and moreover, it's a myth because it's just arbitrary that we say this kind of thing is life, this kind of thing is not life, and so on. Um, ultimate, let's see, in the supreme sense, it's all arbitrary, although one can give all kinds of rationale for uh, schemes of um, emergence and things like that, which um, have a cogency within those schemes, but ultimately uh, that we should um, stick to such a scheme, have the will to stick to it is arbitrary um, because everything uh, up and down can no longer be uh, distinguished. There are matters of... Um, the accidents of the will, um, deciding some things are more important than other things, some things are higher, that there's a mature being called man, that there's a halfway house called woman, that there's an immature being called a child, for instance, that childhood is only the stage that's leading up 
to maturity, for instance, that the human being as a whole is, was always leading up to this maturity and the idea of uh, political rights and equality. And, uh, but now it's gotten there in Hegel's time, but it has to be realized in other such scheme, teleological um, schemes, uh, which Nietzsche throws out. All this supposedly in direct speculation we could put aside and just ask the question of Dasein. Could we ask the question of Dasein simply directly? Okay, so we have one way of doing that with obviously with phenomenology, right? We could just ask how does it look directly and then try to not be biased by what we know about um, uh, what we think we know about reality from common sense, let's say. Uh, that would be one rep um, approach. Um, so how does Heidegger do it? Does Heidegger, is he very concerned with the cogency of the historicist view? In some way he is, because he breaks from the Catholic system on the basis of the cogency of historicism of the um, transformation of the um, views through the history of being. Um, perhaps the poetic vision, the poetic mode of um, showing the look of things is more like the direct claim to read the truth um, in such a way that it's offers an immediate signpost to us that tells us what to do um, rather than going through all the, um, the um, hint or trepa, as it were, the back steps through the cogency, um, building it up, building up the um, impelling nature of the argument. Um, simply asking about various issues, um, directly. Um, how can we ask then about Dasein directly and what happens when we throw out any consideration about the general opinions which were are part of us? Now aren't the general opinions part of us? Isn't the cogency concerned part of Das Man? Um, and we actually, aren't we the kind of being that um, is partly the peculiar individual um, and partly the collective um, being absorbed in the currency of popular opinion and the currying of the favor of others through popular opinion and through what makes sense? Um, it would seem to me on this score the approach to the direct speculation to the the truth of being would have to overcome I would say the approach that's popular in Derrida so for instance I don't think it depre we um it should depreciate Derrida's view, but just for thinking about this one approach to Dasein, um, it's in my view that when Derrida, who emphasizes absence quite a bit, and he seems to understand Heidegger to say the Greeks focused on presence or availability to the exclusion of absence or... Um, the want of something, um, which then vaguely we could understand as um, sort of animal as that which just sees in this sort of Apollonian Dionysian um, contest. There's an animal that's just captivated, and then you could say the in the extreme. Um, Zuhandenheit is a kind of just simple captivation, just a captivated um, look of things. 
with no outlook on the part of the captivated. Um, only the look of things, no outlook. On the other hand, availability, sheer availability of the Fioris, the highest form of practice for the Greeks would be pure outlook and no uh, accidental thing. And the accidental thing is the, the look of things. Only the outlook of reason. Um, this absence, this whole way of thinking, I believe, is it, it reminds of what Nietzsche said about the, um, the death being a particular kind of light. Absence is simply a kind of presence. I would say that in contradistinction to Derrida's reading. I don't want to depreciate Derrida's reading. Derrida's reading... Um, I suppose it, most people will consider it much more uh, worthwhile than my own thinking. Um, and I don't want to depreciate that any more than I want to depreciate Dugan's thinking by the criticisms I make of him. And if I were more consistent, perhaps also Zizek's. But what I'd say is, here is another way to think through it and... I personally find it more congenial, or to say another way, I find it self-evidently so. I think Heidegger thought it this way. Um, absence is simply another form of presence. It's something we have available to us. Um, uh, again, I'll point to the, um, the train example and the um, examples of the kinds of boredom. Um, now, whether there's a higher, more subtle form of absence, maybe that Derrida is thinking that could be, I don't know. But on the whole, I would say, as a way to the pure speculation, we should um, begin um, by taking it for granted that Dasein must regard everything that it can become aware of as part of the presence. Um, that thought has as little cogency as it strikes me in a way, but it has an intelligibility. Uh, all right, so let's try to work with that again. So, so far we haven't really stated um, the so-called speculative approach, the direct approach to the truth of being, but we've kind of prepared it a bit. <clears throat> 